Hi, and welcome to this general introduction to X-ray computer tomography. In this course, we're going to talk about a lot of things. We're going to talk about the history very shortly, why we want to use X-ray computer tomography, how it works, and we're going to talk quite a bit about components, because I like components. We're going to talk about reconstruction, considerations for making a scan, and some things that we... There are some important things that we will not talk about as well, but we will mention them. <laughs> so let's jump in. So, the history of X-ray computer tomography basically started with Wilhelm Röntgen when he discovered the X-rays and uh, actually made an X-ray image of his wife's hand, so that's very lovely of him. This was, of course, before we knew about the dangers of radiation. Uh, and then we have another very important person, with, which is Johan Radon, who actually invented the math that we needed for computer tomography, uh, the computed step, <laughs> before we actually knew that we needed it. Great job. Uh, then we, of course, had Alan Cormack and Sir Godfrey Hounsfield, who actually invented the first CT scanner in the 70s. Um, the first CT scanner was made for medical purposes, to scan humans and human brains and so on. Um, and that was quite a big discovery for diagnostics within medicine, because uh, it turns out that it's pretty helpful to know what things look like on the inside. And this is what we can do with computer tomography. So today, we have CT scanners in hospitals all over the world. They are everywhere, they are super useful, and they actually got a Nobel Prize for this discovery uh, a while back, which was great. <laughs> so this is a very, very widespread technology, but mostly within medicine. So we can use tomography for other things too. As the hardware developed, actually, we started to be able to look through metals uh, and uh, I think at that point we started to see a lot more of CT being used for material characterization but also for like uh, metrology purposes just to measure things that you can't see with line of sight. Tomography is a really great tool. So to use tomography we use something called x-rays. Uh, x-rays are basically light with a very high uh, energy so they can penetrate through material. Uh, this is one of the first x-ray tubes that we ever built. So Basically, electrons hit the target material in vacuum and they generate X-rays. We will talk more about that later. Uh, and also, the word tomography uh, means slice, and it's from Greek. So, to slice something into very thin slices, that's basically tomography. So, this is really what the technique is all about. So, it has to do with how X-rays attenuate when they travel through material. So here you can see three different types of materials that have very different electron densities, or <laughs> maybe you should actually talk about densities instead, because that's very closely linked. If you have a material with very high density, they, it will attenuate a lot of electrons. No, sorry, a lot of photons, <laughs> a lot of X-rays, compared to materials that have less density. And you can see that here by uh, the indication of the pixel behind on the screen there, that you get more photons through the lighter material than you get with the dense material. Gold is more dense than iron, which is more dense than water. So we can distinguish between relative densities using, using x-rays. Uh, we can also measure distances or thicknesses of material, because the more material you have, the more x-rays will attenuate as they travel through it. So we can also get uh, morphological information about your sample. Uh, so let's talk a little bit about why we want to use tomography at all. So imagine this logo, or actually look at this logo of AIF. If you just look at it with line of sight, you get a nice 2D image, you can measure a lot of stuff like distances and angles, and actually all of those are just guesses, right? Because you only see the 2D image. And if you actually look into the sample instead, into the volume of the sample, you might find out that there is a lot more information there to discover. And this is what X-ray computer computer tomography is all about, to actually look inside of your samples. So these are some examples of what we actually look at with computer tomography. This is just what we did at AIF during uh, the year of 2020, or just some examples actually of what we did. So you can see the range of, uh, of material groups that we can actually investigate. Uh, basically anything that we can shine our, uh, our X-ray source through is something that we can look at here. So there's a lot of stuff we can do. Uh, and this is also like a general view of where computer tomography fits in the grander scheme of, mater of material characterization. 
So you can see MicroCity is the big blue box up on the right. You can see that we can actually reach spatial resolutions beneath the micron by going very, very deep into the sample. So the range where you can actually use micro, micro CT is very, very big. And also with the more fancier CT techniques like the hard and soft nano CT techniques, they are kind of limited to synchrotrons. But anyway, you can actually reach the nanometer regime of spatial resolution. So we are actually sniffing up on SEM. Uh, we're still not at TEM levels, but maybe soon. <laughs> so it's a very, very versatile technique. We cover a huge range of different samples and different applications. So let's look at how it actually works. So in X-ray tomography, you have three critical components. You have the X-ray source, and you have the sample stage, and you have the detector array out there on the right. And basically what we do is that we fire up the X-ray source, and we take 2D projections or images of our sample as we rotate it inside of the beam. And we collect a lot of these 2D images, typically in the thousands. The goal of collecting all of these images is to reconstruct them into 3D volume where we can actually measure stuff. But this is the first step. We just collect lots of 2D images. Uh, yes, so there are different types of systems, of course. And this, what I'm showing you right now, is a cone beam system. You can see that the, it is a cone. And the only thing you need to do to make the system work is to rotate the sample and collect images. There are also other systems that are they have benefits and they have limitations. For example, here you have the fan beam. So instead of having an area detector, you have a line detector. Here, of course, you need to translate the sample up and down. So you need to make a full scan at a certain height, and then you need to move your sample to the next pixel height, actually, and make a full scan again. So this naturally takes a lot longer, but you can reach higher qualities with this type of system. And if you have a huge amount of brilliance, like in the synchrotron, you could actually use this type of a setup if you want. Or you can even use the pencil beam. So this was the first types uh, that we actually had. We only have one pixel to collect photons. Of course, here you need to translate the sample both up and down and sideways. So this takes a very, very, very long time. And you have very, very high requirements on the precision of the stage to make this work at all. There are also some more novel systems like the one I'm showing here, uh, where you actually have the, the sample fixed and you rotate the rest of the equipment instead. So you rotate, rotate the source and the detector. This is very similar to what they do in medicine, where the patient is stationary and you rotate the equipment around them. And this is typically more unstable, but the reason that we would want to do this is that we can increase the scanning speed quite a lot if we do this. You can imagine if you spin your sample very, very fast, it will move around and the sample cannot move during a CT scan. So we have to resort to this solution instead. And uh, the, the way that we actually use this today is to, it's in novel systems that are called 4D systems. Where we actually, <coughs> so the 4 stands for that we can actually resolve time. Not perfectly, of course, but we can, actually do a complete scan in like one to two seconds. And when you make scans that fast, you can actually get a progression through time when you look at the volumes of your sample. So you can see how, how something is developing, how fluid travels through a foam or something. So that's a, that's a novel application that people are, have started to use. Uh, it's linked to the um, increased power of the hardware that we can even do this type of things. And then, of course, we have the nice assistance where you can have parallel beams. Uh, <laughs> so again, here you would only need to rotate the sample and you will have an artifact-free reconstruction, which is very nice. But you would have to have a lab inside of a donut. Not everyone has that. <laughs> if you do, you're very lucky. You can get some time in them, in the synchrotrons, but uh, the lab systems are getting quite good as well these days. So now we're going to take a look at the components. Um, quite a deep look actually, but it's, it's important to know how, or have a basic idea at least, about how the system actually works to figure out when it doesn't work what's wrong. <laughs> so let's dive in a bit to this. First, we will look at the X-ray source, which is a very, very important component of the X-ray system. 
<coughs> so the way that we generate the X-ray spectrum is with shooting electrons into a target. So first we need to generate the electrons. And we can commonly do this with a fermionic filament. It's basically like a lamp. We heat up a filament, typically of tungsten, and we will lower the work function and it will start to emit electrons. And of course also produce a lot of heat and wear on the filament. So there are other ways to do this too, where you can have, for example, a crystal that you heat up instead, so you can have a more precise emission of the electrons. And we have even more fancier ways. So yeah, so these are fermionic emission. But you have fancier ways with field emission where we can ha actually have like a little wire of tungsten and we can coat it and then we can use a bias or an electric field to actually pull the electrons off the filament so we don't have to heat it as much and it will last much longer. So typically uh, the, the field emission type is what we have in, the, in closed x-ray tubes where you cannot go into them and do maintenance um, because then the filaments need to last for a long time. Uh, and some systems actually have combinations of them. Uh, we have one of those systems actually. But what we do with the electrons is that we fire them into an anode or a target material where we get a lot of funky interactions. So if you do this, you will generate a lot of stuff. You will generate secondary electrons, auxiliary electrons, visible light, backscattered electrons, scattered ele electrons, a lot of stuff. But most importantly, you will generate X-rays, Bremsstrahlung and characteristic X-rays. <laughs> Not a lot of them, actually. It turns out that like only 1% of the energy that we put in will actually be generated into X-rays and an even smaller amount will actually go in the direction where we want them to go. So there is a very big loss here in this step for X-ray generation. But anyway, we will get Bremsstrahlung and characteristic X-rays. Bremsstrahlung is basically when the electron is deflected a little bit when it approaches an atom and it will uh, change a bit in energy and that difference in energy will be converted into a photon and sent away. And this basically creates a spectrum that goes all the way from basically zero to the highest energy that the incident electrons actually have. So this is what creates an X-ray spectrum. We also get the characteristic X-rays where, uh, where an electron knocks an already existing electron out of, out of its orbital in an atom and another electron takes that one's place and the difference between those orbitals will be uh, the energy of a photon emitted from the, from the atom. And uh, this basically depends on the material, uh, what types of peaks you can get from characteristic, characteristic X-rays. And if we look something like this, so this is the spectra you get from a tungsten uh, target, which is most common, I think. You can use other materials, of course, like copper and molybdenum. There are different types of target materials depending on what you're intending to scan. This is the one for tungsten. And here you can see how the photon energy depends on the acceleration voltage of the, of the electrons. So you can see that spectrum, that long, long tail, that is the Bremsstrahlung, and you can see the peaks, and those are the characteristic X-rays. So this is both good and bad that it looks like this. <laughs> we will discuss that later on. Um, so there are many different types of sources or X-ray sources. And I want to show a few of them now because I think it's very interesting and it can be good to know that uh, depending on which system that you use, it will be quite different uh, and what you should expect from the system should be different as well. So this is uh, the, the, the setup, what it looks like for a transmission target where you have a filament and you shoot the electrons and you focus them and you center them and you hit them into a transmission target. And the transmission target is basically just a thin disk where the electrons hit and you get x-rays. And this can be quite nice because you can get pretty small spot sizes if you have a very thin, uh, thin target. So you can get the small spot size, but of course if you have a very thin target, you will get a lot of heat buildup and it will deplete very fast. So you can only use low power uh, and you have to change it out a lot. Uh, but of course you get a small spot size, which is the interaction zone there. And we will talk about later why that is important. Perhaps the most common one, or at least it used to be the most common type, is the reflection target. Where you basically shoot the electrons into a target that looks basically like this. So you have this inter interaction zone and you collect the x-rays like this. Uh, 
Here you can of course put in more electrons because this is bigger and it's easier to cool so you can have a higher power. Uh, it will last for longer before you burn through it. It can last for quite a while actually. But the con is of course that the spot size will be much bigger because you have a, such a big chunk of target material that you shoot this into so the interaction region will be very big and uh, you will have a big spot size. And then you have the rotary target which is interesting. Uh, so if you want to have a really really high flux you can actually have a target that continuously rotates. Uh, so this disc here would rotate around so you would always have fresh material to shoot into which means that you can have a high power without overheating it so it will last for a long time. Uh, but you will also have a lot, very large spot size and you will have some vibrations in here because there's movement and uh, you don't want the spot size moving around. So this is for high powered ap uh, applications. But uh, you can find this if you look for it. You also have some more novel uh, ways of generating X-rays, like the metal jet, which is uh, a really innovative new way of doing this, which is that you have a continuous jet of metal that flows down. And I think they use gallium for this. There are different types of alloys they can use, but I think they use gallium. So you have gallium running down in a very, very, very thin stream, a very stable, a very stable stream of gallium that flows and you shoot your electrons in there and you generate your x-rays. And since you always have new material in the interaction zone, there is basically not really, you can go very, very high in power here. So you can have a very, very high power, which is, is a very high flux. You never deplete the material. Uh, the cons currently is that it seems to be very high maintenance because this is basically still under development uh, to some extent. So some of these sources, from, from what I heard, work great, and some of them need maintenance almost weekly. Um, but it's a really, really pr promising thing, and we, we really we are interesting, interested in getting very high fluxes. Uh, so if, if this starts to work good, then it's super promising. Um, and there are other techniques too. I think this will be the last one that I'll show. But this one is called the FAST, the Fine Array Anode Source Technology. It's developed by a specific company. Um, and if you look in a material table for like what material has the highest thermal conductivity, you will find that it's diamond. So if you want to conduct heat from something, then of course you should embed it in diamond. And that's what they did basically. So they have target material as small strips embedded in diamond, and they just fire an electron beam on this entire thing and generate a lot of x-rays. Uh, of course, it will not be a very nice uh, spot size if you do it this way. So they need to apply some X-ray optics afterwards, which complicates things a lot. But they can still get a very high flux uh, from this. Uh, I think these are on the market now, uh, since a year or so. Uh, this is constantly developing, which is super interesting. Uh, so, so these seem to have a very high flux and you can get a relatively small spot size with the optics but it seems to, to be kind of limited in the energies that you can use though. So you can only use fairly low energies, which might be fine uh, depending on what you want to do. Uh, so that's another technique. And uh, yeah, also let's look a bit at the Linac. So if you really, really need high power, you can use a Linac where you actually use acoustic waves to accelerate the electrons even faster to increase their energy. Uh, and to then make your Bremsstrahlen spectrum a bit longer. Uh, so this is what you use if you want to have really, really high-powered applications, like if you want to get through a wall of concrete or something, then you can use this. Um, and of course, the top of the line. If you use a synchrotron, you will have undulators, which basically shakes the electron beam back and forth or up and down, and it will emit very, very specific energies uh, depending on how you do this. So you can get a very, very high flux and you can get a very, very specific energies, avoid a lot of problems and make very nice high accuracy scans. Of course, you need to live in a donut uh, <laughs> and many of the lab systems are getting good enough actually uh, for, for many applications. So let's take a fast look then at the sample stage, which is, which is also an important thing. Of course, as you can imagine, it needs to be very, very accurate since this rotates it needs to be accurate within 0 0.0.5 degrees almost, because if it gets out of that limit, it will start to mess up the indexing between these 2D projections that uh, the system takes. So it will not know at which uh, angle it should put them for the reconstruction and there will be lots of issues. So 
The stage needs to be super accurate. And this is actually the accuracy of our stage in our X-Radio system, where you can see that its movement during a full rotation is within a micron, which is pretty good. <laughs> so they need to be super accurate. And uh, uh, of course, you can also move the stage around in many systems. So uh, the, the stage can usually move, but in some systems you can move the source and the detector as well. And the reason that you move these things around is what you can see here, that if you have a comb bin system, this basically defines the magnification. It's like a pr you, you really project your sample on the detector, right? So you can easily magnify it by pulling the sample closer to the source. That will give you higher magnification. Uh, there are some problems with this that we will look at later, but that's basically it. The, the, the closer the sample is to the source, the higher the magnification. And you can also do a lot of f funny stuff with the stage. You can do like compression, tension, and alter the temperature with some special stages. So you can look at the pr progression of cracks or something in if you do tensile or if you do compression. And you can look at how things are affected by temperature. Uh, so there are many types of stages that you can actually put in the CETA systems to look at different stuff. And perhaps the most important thing about this is that you should be really, really careful to make sure that your sample does not move around during the scan. Because as we discussed previously, you need to have really, really high precision in the stage so that the system always, know, always knows where the sample is. But this, of course, doesn't matter if your sample rattles around on the sample stage. So it needs to be completely fixed. If you have your sample in a fluid, you need to fix it somehow so it doesn't move around. Uh, usually a good thing is to glue your sample down if you can, just to make, eliminate the chances of it moving. Because if it moves, it destroys the entire scan. Because the system will not know where the sample is or where it should have been. Uh, so let's go to the final component, the detectors. So this is also a very critical component, of course, and there is a lot to know here. Um, so these are just a few of the techniques, actually. I'm not going to talk about all of them at all. Um, let's first just look at how a pixel actually works for X-rays. So X-rays are great because they can travel through material. <laughs> this is, of course, a problem if you try to use a normal camera, because the X-rays will just travel through it. So what you actually first have to do is to have a scintillator material that converts the X-rays into visible light that we can co collect on a photodiode. Where we convert the visible light into electrons that we can store and then read out as an image. So the scintillator is critical and there are many, many different types of scintillators that are good at different things. Typically we want to have a very high light yield because we already have a ton of losses and we don't want to lose more X-rays in the, in the, in the scintillator. Uh, Inevitably, though, we got, we're going to. <laughs> and there are, there are always payoffs. Like if you have a very high light yield, you probably will have problems with the decay time or emission maximum or something. So there are many different types that you can choose here. Also, how easy they are to manufacture is a critical thing to think about. And actually, uh, scintillators used to look like this. So it was just like a homogeneous uh, layer that we put on our cameras or our pixels. And then when the X-rays came in, the visible light could actually go in any, in any direction. And this would give us a pretty bad spatial resolution for our systems. Like <laughs> the chances that the, the, uh, the, the light, the visible light that was emitted from the X-ray would actually go straight to the detector was fairly low. To say almost, uh, uh, almost impossible that that would happen. <laughs> uh, so what we're actually doing today is something much smarter which is that we create this type of reflected la layers or crystal structures in the scintillator material where we can actually focus where the visible light is, is going to go uh, after it's created, which will increase the spatial resolution by quite a bit. So this is how those different layers uh, can look. Um, the cesium iodine uh, looks pretty cool. Uh, and here's, yeah, this is just an image of how how they actually manufacture them, uh, which is quite cool. I'm not going to go into that. Uh, you can do a lot of cool stuff with detectors. So this is one of the cool things you can do. Like you can actually stack uh, photodiodes or pixels on top of each other. So in this case, you can have a very thin scintillator material and a photodiode at the top to collect 
low energy light and then you can have a bigger one underneath to co collect the high energy light. And by doing this, you can extend the dynamic range quite a bit of your, of your detector and get nice contrast of both low attenuating and high attenuating material. So this is quite cool. Uh, but let, let's look at one of the most common types that, that we actually use, which is the charge couple device or the CCD, where you have scintillator gates and you have like an insulator and you have N-type silicon and P-type silicon to actually capture the electrons. So we shine the light on top of here and, they, and the light is actually converted into electrons and the electrons are stored underneath these gates. So we hold them there in potential wells until we want to empty them out. And to empty them out, we actually move them sideways like this. So you move them along the, uh, the arrays of pixels. Um, so this can cause us quite a bit of problem, but it's actually very nice to do it this way because it means that these pixels can be very, very, very tightly packed. You can have very small pixels and they can be very close to each other. So that's the benefit of doing it this way. Um, there is another very common type that, that, that we use a lot today. It's called the CMOS. Um, and it's probably going to be used even more going forward because it behaves a bit differently. So the CCD, as I showed you, it empties like this. So you empty the array like this and it will take a long time. So collecting an image can take quite a bit of time on the CCD and you can have quite a bit of noise when you move the, move the electrons through all of the pixels like this. While the CMOS have all of the electronics connected to each photodiode. So it will collect an image like this instead. So it's much, much, much faster the drawback of this used to be that the pixels were much bigger for a CMOS, so your resolution of the detector would be lower, but actually the development has gone very rapidly here. I think it's uh, largely due to the, uh, the cameras that people want in their cell phones, like the megapixels of those super tiny cameras, are, they are very high now. Uh, and this really helps the development of detectors. So, so I think we will start to see CMOS a lot more than CCD in the future because uh, it's just, it collects photos much faster or it reads out the image much faster, which is very nice. Uh, and CMOS is typically used for flat panel detectors today where you basically stack a lot of them together like small panels on a flat panel. Uh, there's another nice thing that is called resolution at a distance. This is, I think it still is size proprietary stuff. Uh, where instead of smearing the scintillator on top of your actual pixels, you can smear the scintillator on top of an objective, like this. So the scintillator is actually in the first step of the objector, uh, objective array there, like that dark patch there. there. That is the scintillator material. It creates visible light that we can easily use objectives on to magnify our, our sample a lot. So. With this type of setup, you first have your geometrical magnification and then you have this optical magnification as well, which allows us to get really, really, really high magnifications. Something we weren't really able to do when all, only using the, the projecting style of, of magnifying. So this is quite cool and this is something we can do in the x radia machine. Uh, so let's talk a bit about the lab systems that are available today. So you have the really high end to scan small stuff and you have the mid-range and you have the very, very, very high range. <laughs> so you can scan anything from millimeter size samples or smaller, and there you can actually expect to get less than a micron in spatial resolution. And you can get, go all the way up to scanning like full containers or cars. But there, of course, you should expect the resolution closer to the millimeter range. So there's always like a payoff. The bigger the sample, typically the lower the resolution you should expect. And the range is huge uh, from which we can scan samples. So there is probably someone who can help you. You just have to find a nice uh, or the, the right institute for your questions. Uh, we, we can scan a lot of stuff. This, these are the scanners that we currently have at AIF. So we have a desktop scanner from, from, from Broker, a sky scanner. Uh, it runs from 20 to 50 kV, which basically means that it's mostly for biological samples and perhaps some polymers because uh, it's not very high in energy and it's not very high in resolution either so around 10 microns is probably where we can go with that system 
does have quite a bit of power though, so it can usually be quite fast scans. And then we have our Extradia system, Extradia 5 ton Versa, that goes from 30 to 160 kV, which means that we can actually scan up to the range of metals. Commonly only like a few millimeters of metals if you go to the really dense ones, but still we can. And on the high end of the resolution, we can go beneath one micron, which is quite impressive. So let's talk a little bit about reconstruction, which is what we do with all of those 2D images that we collect. So to do this, we have an example of the AIF logo. Uh, and let's only look at the eye of the AIF. So if we look at, at a projection of the, of the eye, if it looked like this, something funky is going on in there. So let's try to figure out what that is. Let's first only consider a plane. So we only consider this plane of the eye, which would correspond to this pixel array on the detector. If we take a look at the intensity uh, profile of that, uh, of that line of pixels, it will look like this. And if we zoom in, it will look like this. So the X-rays have traveled through your sample and created that profile. What we can do now is that we can smear that profile backwards over empty space, called back projecting, which would create this image. Okay, why is that useful? Well, if we do it from more orientations, and we combine them together, we start to see something interesting. It actually turns out that if we do this for all the orientations that we have collected in the scan, so what you see here is actually a sinogram, and it's that intensity profile from 0 to 180 degrees of this sample. Uh, so it looks like a sinusoidal uh, curve, and that's why we call it a sinogram, but it's basically those intensity profiles through the entire rotation of the sample. If we do this process for all of these orientations and combine them, you will find that something quite extraordinary starts to happen. As you can see here, the numbers here indicates the number of projections that we have, have used or the number of orientations. And you can see that the image starts to form and it forms quite nicely. Uh, you can also see some weird like contour lines here and that's because I used a filter. If I wouldn't have done it, it would have looked like this. We're not gonna go too much into this, but you need to do some Fourier transform magic to, to get this to work right. But we have it pretty much figured out by now. Uh, <laughs> there are many different types of doing it as well, uh, but this method works good enough in many cases. So what you do is that you create this slice, not only for this detector uh, or this line on the detector, but you do it for the entire detector. And that will create a final volume of your sample where we can define or we, we can distinguish between what is material and what is, uh, and what is background uh, depending on the intensity of the pixels. So a high intensity means that it has a high attenuation and high density and a low intensity like a dark voxel. Voxels are 3D pixels. A dark voxel means that it has a low attenuation. And now we actually have a full 3D volume of your sample. So this slice would correspond to this slice in the real sample. And it turns out that there's some sort of uh, uh, foamy gold, or is it cheese maybe, inside of the AIF logo. So this was using absorption contrast. But there are also other techniques. For example, we have something called phase contrast, which is very useful when we try to image materials with very, very similar attenuation. For example, if you want to image two different types of polymers, uh, that are very, very nestled into each other and they have almost the same attenuation, there is a chance that we can distinguish them anyway through the use of phase contrast. And that is that when the X-rays travel from one material to another, there is a very, very, very small angle of diffraction where you actually deflect the X-rays a little bit. And if we have a very small spot size and very small pixels on the detector, we can actually capture this. Given that we have enough distance between the source and the detector as well, you need to have as parallel of a beam as you can to actually pick up these small differences. But in our Extradia system, we can actually do this. So you can get contrast for materials that have almost the same attenuation. You can also use dual energy. If you want to make a scan of something where you have a very, very high, uh, high density material and low density material in, in, in the same part, you can actually do two different scans, one at a high energy and one at a low energy, and combine them to get a very nice result. Uh, so let's go into some considerations that you should make uh, 
when you're actually making a scan, things that are important to think about. So one of the most important things are actually the sample positioning. So let's say that we want to scan this piece of red material. Uh, it looks like a rectangle. So this is our sample stage and we just lay our sample down like this. How will this work? Well, if we take a top view of our system, it will look like this. We turn on the x-ray and let's look what happens along this line. So let's consider the x-rays traveling only through this line. They, they will look through a material thickness that varies like this during the rotation of the sample. This is a big problem. You typically do not want to have very thick material and then very thin material as you go around because it will mess up the energy settings. Instead, you should have probably placed your sample like this. So if you have your sample standing up like this and we look at the same material thickness curve by rotational angle, it will look something like this instead, which is a lot more homogeneous. And actually the best type of sample geometry that you can have for CT scanning is a cylinder because it has the aspect ratio of one, right? It has the same thickness no matter how you look at it. Um, so if you have the power to change the geometry of your sample and you know you want to CT scan it, then consider making them into cylinders because that will help out a lot to get high image quality. Yeah, so you can see the, the, the differences here. And we would actually need to set up the energy to get through the very thick material if you scanned it like this. And that would mean that we would overexpose it for the other orientations. And that is not good. Uh, so always consider the sample orientations and if possible, make the samples cylindrical. Here is, an, uh, is a table of typical uh, thicknesses that we can get through with our X-Radia system at max power. So you can see that this is very closely linked to density, of course. Uh, if you go for low density materials, as calcium or something that you have in bones, we can get through 40 millimeters, so really thick bones. But if you go up to the high densities, like, like uh, metals, if you go to copper, we can only get through like five millimeters. Or if you go very far to like lead, we can get through half a millimeter. So we can still scan them, but you need to adjust your sample size then. Uh, if you want to do that. Here you can see how it's linked, the density and, uh, uh, and how far we can get through the samples. So it's very closely linked density and penetration depth. Uh, we can also talk a little bit about the flat field correction <laughs> or in some systems it's, it's called you need to take a reference image and that's because if you just take a normal image of your detector, it will look something like this, at least for a flat panel. Here you can see the different panels that makes up the flat panel, and you can see that there is some sort of pr protective shield on it. You can see that it looks like a hexagon pattern, and you can see that it's very inhomogeneous and you hear a lot of noise. So you can actually first adjust that by doing some interpolations between the areas where you don't have pixels, and you will get an image closer to this. And then you can actually take a reference image of nothing and subtract that and you will get a flat image. And you need to do this before you start to collect real images. Some systems do this by default, some don't. It's important to know that you should do it because the results will be terrible if you don't. Uh, and then there's the question of how many projections should I have in my scan? And well, <laughs> it's not an easy question to answer. So if you imagine us taking the image like that, and this is the space of our voxels, uh, then you could imagine that if we rotate these projections, we have to, we, we should only allow for a rotation of, of uh, theta there so that we don't slip out of the outermost voxel. We always want to be within that voxel range if you want to have one projection for, for at least one voxel at the periphery of our scan. So W there would be the width of our detector, for example. So it turns out then that the number of projections should be around, uh, should be larger than two pi divided by that angle increment. And it turns out that that is quite a lot. Uh, so this is for a two by two K detector. It turns out that you will need to use many, many thousands of uh, projections to achieve this. And it's not always true that you have to. Um, 
So there are many other parameters that affect this that maybe it's not important to have a single slice on every pixel on the periphery of a scan because there are other things that will create noise out of that anyway. Uh, so what we typically do is let's say you do half of that. So we typically scan from around 1600 to maybe 3000 projections. It really depends on uh, what you want to see and what your sample looks like and how much time you have. So it's, there's actually uh, a thing when you do the reconstruction where you actually need to have a projection that looks along a flat surface to be able to reconstruct it as a flat surface. So if you have a sample where you know that there are many flat surfaces, like if you're scanning salt or something, that has lots of cubes with flat surfaces, then you need to have more projections because you need, that will increase the chance that some of them will look along the planes and will reconstruct them as flat planes. Otherwise, there might be a bit of a bulge on them. Uh, so that, that would be an artifact that you should look out for. Uh, so if you know that you have flat, flat surfaces in your sample, you should increase the number of projections. Uh, of course, it depends on what you want to see and how much time you have. <laughs> because if you increase the numbers of projections, you increase the scan time significantly, of course. Uh, another thing that's good to know about is the penumbral blurring. And this is where the spot size really starts to matter. So it turns out that your sample actually gets gets blurred a bit depending on the spot size. That's the penumbral blur and we will talk a little bit about how that works and why. So this is the, uh, the target that we looked at before, the electrons shoot into the target and it generates uh, x-rays. And the spot size is actually the, the full width half maximum of the intensity profile that you get from this spot size uh, or from this interaction volume, I'm sorry. We call that the spot size. And I said before that the smaller this is, the better. And this is why. So imagine this is our sample looking at it from the top. You have the spot size and you have the detector. If the spot size is a perfect dot, if it's infinitely small, you will have a sharp image like this. But in reality, the spot size is never just a dot. It always has some sort of uh, dimension to it. And if it does, you will have this effect. So if we blur the edges of the sample because the dimension of the spot size will, will, will cause this, uh, uh, this blurring effect that you can see uh, on the lines here. And this, of course, also depends on where you position your sample. So if you move your sample closer to the spot, this will have a bigger effect. So here you can just compare it with the previous position of the sample, uh, which means that bringing the sample really close to your spot will give you a lot more blur. Uh, and that's a problem. <laughs> because typically you want to put your sample close to the source so that you can bring your detector in and you can decrease the distance between the source and the detector. And by doing that, you can reduce the scan time because that will increase the exposure. Uh, but this will be the cost then. The cost will be penumbral blurring. And here you can see again, like the different sources that we looked at before. Uh, and how they affect this metric. So transmission is really good. Uh, the fast one also looks to be very, very good, uh, but it's using objectives, so that's a bit of cheating. <laughs> uh, but this is why spot size really matters. Uh, this is actually the spot size of our X-Radia system that we could measure. Uh, so it's around two microns actually, throughout the, uh, between two and three, I should say throughout the entire energy range, which is really nice. Uh, the worst part is around 110, which is a bit weird, but it's good at low energies and good at high energies, uh, which is great. Another thing we need to know about is beam hardening. Uh, you will always have this in your scans uh, because you are using a polychromatic spectra, like the branch Straulung. And uh, this is why I said it's for both good and bad that we have the branch Straulung. We need it to get the high energy photons, but at the same time, it will cause this artifact. And the beam hardening is actually, yeah, you see it like this. It, uh, it turns the shell of a component or the periphery of a, of a component. Uh, it gives it a very high density, even though it doesn't have one. As you can see it in this image, the, the bright means high density. So even though this sample here 
this is a this is a slice from a homogeneous sample. It should have the same gray gray value throughout the sample, but it doesn't. It has this intensity uh, in intensity profile to it. It has this cupping effect, and the cupping effect is beam hardening. It happens because when the low energy photons uh, hit the sample, they attenuate very very fast compact compared to the high energy photons. And our detector cannot account for this because our detector only counts photons. Like it doesn't care which energy they have. So naturally, if you have a lot of low energy photons that travel around your sample and doesn't attenuate at all, it will give a very, very high value for them outside your sample. And then it starts to hit your sample and they attenuate very, 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 very fast. So the detector will think that they attenuate very fast because it, the material is very dense but it actually has to do with the energy of the photons. Uh, so this is basically how the attenuation looks. And sadly, attenuation in material is not something line year or nice looking, so we cannot really do an uh, analytical compensation for beam hardening. We can only do approximations, because uh, it doesn't look very nice. As you can see here, if you zoom in a bit more, at the low energies, you can see that we almost only have the photoelectric absorption. When we go to higher energies, it becomes more and more scattering. Uh, and it, it, it behaves a bit weirdly, and it's different in each material. And you have that K-edge, uh, where you have the transitions, and it's different in all materials. <laughs> so there's no smart way of doing this analytically uh, that we have come up with, anyway. And here you can actually see the relative influence of the attenuation, uh, where you see that there's a lot of photoelectric in the beginning and a lot of scattering towards the end. So the way that we combat this uh, is that we have, two, uh, we have two tools. We have the physical filtering, where we actually take a thin piece of a high attenuating material and put it in front of the beam. And by doing that, we actually kill off the low energy photons there. Uh, they actually get attenuated by that film while the more high energy photons travel through. So here's an example of when we do that with uh, uh, 1.3 millimeter copper film. Uh, how the spectra actually gets affected. You can see that it brings down all of the intensity, of course, but at the high end there, at the tail of the branch straudon spectrum, it doesn't bring it, out, bring it down much at all, while in the beginning, almost all of the low energy photons are attenuated. So this is why we call it that we harden the beam, uh, the beam hardening. We harden the beam, by making it more high energy photons rather than low energy photons. So if you scan anything that has a higher attenuation, you definitely need to do this or you will see a very severe artifact. Uh, the last way that we use to combat this, and we usually use them in combination, is that we do some digital filtering. So we digitally filter the projections to account for this. Of course, we cannot do it in a precise way, so we just apply a, a sort of a correction to the entire image, which will give us other problems. For example, in the uncorrected image, you will have an intensity prof profile like this. And now, we can digitally enhance it to look like this. And you can see here that the cost of doing that was that we increased the noise in the sample. Uh, there's almost always a cost to everything. If, if something makes something better, it will make something else worse. That is almost always true. So there's always trade-offs. And also you can go too far, which you should be careful to do, uh, where you can actually get a bulging effect instead, where you have overcorrected for the beam hardening. You will have beam hardening in almost every scan, uh, so you need to learn how to deal with it. Uh, another important thing to think about is the reconstruction. So we have only talked about the uh, FBP or the filtered back projection uh, that you can see over there, but there are many other ways to do this actually. Um, you can use ART or you can use CGLS, you can use SART, you can use SIRT. There are many different ways to reconstruct and the reason why we choose to go with FBP normally is because it was a fast way to reconstruct. And actually today with all the server farms and all that, computational power has become pretty accessible. So maybe that's not a good argument anymore and we should reinvestigate how we reconstruct our data sets. Because here you can actually see that I compare uh, the reconstructed slice with the ground truth and I calculate the normalized mean square error. 
and the lower this value the better and you can see that CGLS pretty much outperforms the other methods by far for this specific type, type of, uh, of sample that I've reconstructed. And actually the method that we most commonly use, the FBP, is, all, is the second to worst method of the, of the ones I tried here. So this can be an important thing uh, to look at actually, how you reconstruct your data. Okay, and what resolution should I expect? This is a question that we always get, like what resolution will you have in the scan? And it comes down a bit to what do you mean with resolution. So there are many different ways that people like to define resolution for X-ray CT. Some manufacturers talk about the spot size of the system, some talk about the nominal resolution, some about the detail detectability, some about spatial resolution, some about the voxel size. Let's take a look at a few different of these. So of course this is the spot size and I don't know why anyone would say that this is a definite measurement of the of the resolution of the system. It's very, very important for sure, but it doesn't give you a definite ID. Like if you have a two micron spot size, that does not mean that you can see things down to two microns always. Um, so uh, I don't know about spot size. Detail detectability is a very interesting metric because <laughs> it's really, at the first glance, it seems like the thing that you would want to measure like when can we actually see what we are looking for? The problem is that it's a bit subjective. So for example, in this image series of, of the AIF uh, text there, when do you think that you can see that it says AIF? And it has a bit to do also with what type of, uh, of, uh, of knowledge do you have of, of your sample? I mean, if we know that it says AIF, then maybe we could claim to see it already on image four or maybe five but if we didn't know that it said AIF maybe we would have to go to picture six and is this picture six or is it picture seven that actually shows us clearly that it is AIF so it's a bit subjective sadly but it is probably the thing that we want to measure but it's, it's too difficult uh, for us to measure in a good way uh, another thing that people like to talk about is the voxel size or basically the size of the pixels that you have in your final scan but this doesn't matter very much. If you have 25,000 pixels, uh, but you need all of them just to define a single spot, then it doesn't really matter that you have that many of them. You could just as well have had one pixel and get the same amount of information. So the size of the pixels is not a good definite value of the resolution of your scan. So this is the nominal resolution, and it, it's not very meaningful um, when you look at what your system can do. So then we have spatial resolution, which I kind of like because spatial resolution basically defines if you can distinguish or at which, at which resolution you can distinguish between different features. So here, for example, uh, I show how to uh, distinguish between two spheres. Like on, on the very far left, we cannot distinguish between them. And in the middle, we cannot distinguish between them, but on the right, we could. So this would be the spatial resolution of a system, like how far apart uh, do, do things have to be before we can distinguish between them. I think this is probably the most decent measurement we have for resolution these days, uh, even though it's not perfect either. Um, what manufacturers do though is super weird. Uh, some of them, they don't define this very well at all. And some of them, they choose to define this based on just 2D projections. So they actually just take a 2D image of a calibration sample such as this and they measure on the 2D projection the smallest feature that they can see. Which makes no sense at all because the resolution of a CETA system is, is the result of all of the components of the system. Uh, it's not just a stationary 2D image, you actually have to rotate the sample and you have to do it over a length, large length of time, uh, sometimes hours. Uh, often hours actually, depending on the resolution that you want, and you need to reconstruct them. Um, so just looking at the 2D projection uh, does not tell you a lot about what the system will actually achieve for a reconstructed scan. Okay, so there are some things now that we have not talked about that are still important if you want to do CT scanning. And one of them is actually the image artifacts that you will encounter. Uh, 
So there are a lot of image artifacts. You definitely have to look them up so that you can recognize them in your scan and perhaps more importantly, so that you can prevent them. Uh, <laughs> you can do a lot actually to prevent many of these artifacts. Some of them are very severe, some of them are more subtle, uh, subtle but it's, uh, it's important to know about them so that you don't measure artifacts in your sample. You should only measure what's actually in there. And then perhaps the most important thing that we haven't talked about is the image processing, which is really what I've talked about today is like 10% of computer tomography investigation. What you really will have to sink your teeth into is how to process the data uh, to get what you want from it. And we actually have a lot of examples of what you can do with computer tomography on the AIF channel. So I would recommend you to go and have a look over there. Um, and if you want to do the analysis yourself, you should expect to have to spend a lot of time actually learning these softwares and concepts. Um, it can take, it can be quite daunting at first, but it's very, very rewarding once you get into it because working with tomography data is amazing and super fun. And that's it for today. So thank you for watching and uh, have fun with computer tomography. Please contact AIF if you want to have anything run and we will help you with how to define scanning parameters and so on. Uh, thank you very much and that's it for me.